In the 5th century BC, a small Greek city-state on the fringes of the civilized world conducted a radical experiment. Democracy, rule by the people. In this episode of Inventing Civilization, we're going to take a closer look at Athenian democracy. Where did it come from? How did it work? And what can we learn from it today? Now, democracy in Athens didn't come about in a single stroke of genius. It was the result of a long evolution triggered, as is so often the case, by crisis. Four men were instrumental in this process. The first was Solon, whose modest reforms made Athens take its first baby steps towards a freer system of rule in 594 BCE. But the city didn't become truly democratic until the revolutionary changes introduced by Cleisthenes in 507 BCE. Half a century later, in 462 BCE, Ephialtes stripped this system of its remaining aristocratic elements, which paved the way for his apprentice, Pericles, to push the system into the deepest of uncharted waters, heralding an era of radical democracy. So when we talk about ancient Athenian democracy, what we really mean is Cleisthenes' system as it existed after the reforms of Ephialtes and under the stewardship of Pericles, when Athens would experience its golden age. This system existed roughly between 460 and 411 BCE. The principle at the core of this system was simply citizen participation. All citizens had a stake in governing their city. Citizens of Athens didn't have a government, they were the government. And the beating heart of this system was the ecclesia, the popular assembly. It consisted of all citizens over the age of 20, who therefore automatically became legislators when they reached that age. The Ecclesia usually met on the Nyx, a gently sloping hill some 500 meters from the Acropolis, which could accommodate 6,000 people. Meetings took place roughly once every nine days and would start at sunrise. By lunchtime, it was usually all over. Votes were relatively rare, the Ecclesia strived for a consensus. And I just want to take a moment to emphasize how completely astonishing all of that really is. Think about it. Six thousand people gather in one place and manage to somehow get everyone to agree on policy before they break for lunch. It's amazing. It's no surprise then that there were a few rules on how to behave. Everyone who wanted to speak on the subject of the meeting was allowed to ascend to the speaker's podium to do so. But they had to be very brief. They were not allowed to deviate. They were not allowed to refer to a different issue. They were not allowed to repeat themselves and they were not allowed to deliver any personal insults. Interruptions also were not tolerated. In other words, the Ecclesia had a very different debating style than most modern parliaments. The Ecclesia was the highest body and the legislative arm of government in Athens. The Ecclesia issued laws and it elected and dismissed officials. It also had the sole authority for declaring war. But it didn't usually set its own agenda. That task was given to the executive arm of government, the boule. Now, when I say the boule was the executive arm of government, that's a bit of a misnomer. Its functions were a combination of the executive and the civil service with just a touch of bureaucracy. It was a council of 500 citizens who were chosen to serve by lot and who had to be at least 30 years old to be eligible. Terms lasted one year and you could only serve twice in a lifetime, unconsecutively. The boule consisted of different subsections and committees that dealt with specific topics, none of which is particularly interesting, but the executive power was concentrated with the 50 Pritanes, who formed a standing committee for a term of 36 days. And for those of you who just did the math, yes, the ancient Athenians thought a year had 360 days. So the Pritanes served every single day during their term, taking care of the day-to-day -day business of the state. They would also receive ambassadors. Furthermore, one of them would be selected by law to serve as epistatis, meaning figurehead. The epistatis would carry the keys to the city's archives and funds. You might compare him to a prime minister, except his term only lasted 24 hours and no one served twice. King for a day, if you will. Or really, he was more of a janitor lumping around a set of keys. If you were particularly unlucky, your term as epistatis would coincide with a session of the ecclesia, which you would then have to lead, which I imagine would have been akin to herding cats. So aside from the ecclesia and the boule, Athens also had strategoi, or generals, and civil magistrates, who were elected by the ecclesia and charged with running the military and the civil service. Again, citizens had to be at least 30 years old to serve, and terms lasted one year. 
The strategoi were a rare feature of continuity. They didn't have term limits. Pericles, for example, served 15 consecutive terms as general. The legal system of Athens featured a jury system that people in modern English-speaking countries would find familiar, although the juries were much larger than anything we're used to today. They ranged from anywhere between 201 jurors to 1,501 jurors, depending on the magnitude and severity of the case. Jurors were chosen by lot and attended only a single trial. Each trial lasted no longer than a day. A verdict would have to be reached before sunset. So, the success of ancient Athenian democracy is open to debate. Some argue it gave Athens its golden age, while others argue that it was the golden age in its empire that allowed Athens to indulge in the luxury of a chaotic form of government. Certainly, Plato was unimpressed by the notion of popular rule, but then, of course, he had witnessed the popular court sentence his beloved mentor Socrates to death. For more on Plato's criticism of democracy, have a look at this video. But if we're going to talk about the shortcomings of ancient Athenian democracy, it's hard to overlook its exclusive nature. These are the people that were actually allowed to participate. Free male Athenian citizens over the age of 20. These are the people that were excluded. Native Athenian women, immigrants and slaves. And all of a sudden it doesn't look like such a great system anymore. So let's have a look at these demographics. Now first, the slaves. We're all in agreement, of course, that slavery is bad. But in the ancient world, it was considered a universal truth and perfectly natural. In that context, it kind of sort of makes sense that you would exclude them from government. Since we're judging Athens by the context of the age, we should also mention that the ancient Athenians treated their slaves relatively better than most surrounding civilizations, like the Persians or the Spartans. This speaks to their favor, even if their conduct would of course be considered completely appalling by modern standards. Then on to the immigrants, or metics as they were known. And here we have to be a bit more critical. Immigrant status was inherited. It was basically impossible for the offspring of an immigrant to become a citizen, ever, no matter how many generations your family had already lived in Athens. Metics were denied all the benefits of citizenship, but shared in all the burdens. They couldn't own property, but they still had to pay taxes. This was very harsh, even by the standards of the time, and we have to fault the Athenians for their rigid exclusion of the metics. But the biggest point of criticism, by far, has to be reserved for the treatment of women. Women were completely sidelined in ancient Athenian society. Their legal status was always associated with the nearest male relation, a father, a brother, or a husband. The status of women was criticized in theater and literature at the time, which means that the Athenians knew that treatment of women was unfair, and yet they failed to do anything about it. So what can we learn from ancient Athenians? Well, on the one hand, democratic Athens proved for the first time in history that individual freedom and a thriving and stable state are not mutually exclusive. This discredited the notion that ordinary citizens have to be subjugated for the greater good of society. On the other hand, Athens offers a stark warning against populism and the tyranny of the majority, which is why philosophers in later ages developed ideas such as inalienable human rights and the rule of law. Democracy offers us the best chance to live in freedom in the same way that a supercar offers us the best chance to travel fast. But you'd be wise really to fit a couple of brakes and a seatbelt. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you'd like to learn more, I've included some suggestions in the description box below. You can also find a suggested reference there in case you'd like to cite this particular video. For now, though, I want to thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.